part of a seminar series at the, uh, at the uh, Asia Center, which with the title of Asia Beyond the Headlines. And this began in the fall of uh, 2017. And it focuses on urgent contemporary issues that cut across Asia. So past uh, seminars have looked at the Belt and Road Initiative, the crisis in the Korean Peninsula, uh, the refugee crisis, and uh, press <coughs> freedoms in Asia, among other uh, issues. So this is a, an interesting uh, opportunity, and I should also say that it's uh, co-sponsored, uh, not only by, uh, sponsored by the Asia Center, but also by the Fairbank Center for China Studies and by the Harvard uh, China Project on Energy uh, uh, Economy and the Environment. So a, li a little bit of introduction to what our plan is here today. My, my hope is that we'll have an interesting interactive uh, conversation with the panel and with the uh, audience on this broad topic of um, climate change and uh, what climate change is doing to you know, critical issues in Asia. We, we may have somewhat of a focus on uh, China, maybe India, but I think the, the, the challenge is obviously larger than that. So in terms of a little bit of background, I'm sure most of the people here know the story. The story is that you know, climate change is a, is a global issue. Um, we're not doing very much to really deal with it. And in fact, the latest uh, IPCC report tells you that if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement or the Paris idea, ideal of, of limiting the growth in, in, in average surface temperature to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, you have to essentially eliminate the use of fossil fuel completely in about 10 or 15 years. So this is a, this is a challenge that is clearly very, very uh, immediate. And you know, there are questions then about if you don't do that, and we're not doing it, we're not, we're not on path to actually even come close to that, then the question is, what do we have to? Uh, have, what do we have to? What, what are the prospects of what we have to face up to? So some of the members of the panel here will give you a sense of uh, what some of those uh, issues are going to be. So um, a little bit of uh, introduction, briefly, to the panel members. We're going to lead off. Uh, we're going to go in, the, in essentially the order in which the names are on the uh, on the uh, on the poster. So John Holdren is going to begin, followed by Peter Huypers, followed by Elsie Sunderland followed by Steve Wofsey, and I will uh, say some things at the end. But the idea of uh, topics here is I asked John, uh, as, as I'm sure everybody knows, John was uh, President Obama's science advisor for eight years. Prior to that, uh, he was uh, at Harvard in uh, both the Kennedy School and the Earth and Planetary Sciences. Prior to that, he was at Berkeley, where he started an energy program. And before that, I guess you were at MIT, <laughs> right? So John keeps moving. <coughs> And now he's back at uh, Harvard. So what I thought would be interesting to hear from John is a little bit about um, his sense of the, the negotiations that he was involved in, the critical negotiations that he was involved with, particularly with China and perhaps India and, uh, and, and other parts of Asia that he might uh, wish to deal with. I think to, to have his perspective, particularly given where things are at the moment, would be, I think, a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity. <coughs> Peter Huybers is in Earth and Planetary Sciences and also in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And Peter is, uh, is an expert on climate and on oceanography, but in particular, he, is, uh, he has been doing some very interesting work on looking at how climate change uh, impacts current and potentially future uh, food production. So he's going to say a little bit about, uh, about that, I think. Elsie Sunderland is um, in both in SEAS and in the Chan School uh, for Public Health, and Elsie is an expert at the interface of climate, uh, uh, of uh, energy, energy uh, of um, environmental chemistry and public health. So she's going to say a little bit, I think, probably about fisheries <coughs> and the implications of climate change for fisheries. So that's sort of the uh, the, the 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 story. And then Steve Wofsey is going to talk about um, uh, I, ways in which you can, in principle, use atmospheric measurements of key gases to infer what the sources are. So this is obviously relevant to dealing with uh, checking up on how countries re report their emissions of CO2 or methane in particular. So Steve will say a little bit about what the potential is for that. So without further ado, let me call on John uh, to, I should, oh, I, I, a little bit, a word of warning here. John has to leave uh, uh, at about one o'clock because he has, uh, he has to teach uh, a class at the Kennedy School and it takes him a very long time to get from here to the Kennedy School. So, John. Thank you, Mike. I said when I arrived, I think we found the two rooms at the greatest distance apart at Harvard uh, without crossing the river. Um, 
Let me say a, a few words of background first, because what happened in the Obama administration in its interactions uh, with China as well as with India had rather long antecedents. There had been uh, quite a lot of interaction between um, U.S. scientists and environmental policy analysts and uh, their counterparts in China uh, going back uh, literally for decades. Uh, I first went to China in 1984, although at that time uh, I was working on arms control issues with the Chinese, uh, nuclear weapons uh, limitation, nonproliferation, and so on. I started working with the Chinese uh, on energy and climate issues in the 1990s. And in fact, in uh, the late 1990s, I started a program here at Harvard in the Kennedy School of Government called the Energy Technology Innovation Project, which had uh, partnerships uh, in both China and India. We, were, we had three geographic focuses, China, India, and the United States. Uh, in China, we were working with the National Development and Reform Commission, with the Ministry of Science and Technology, with Tsinghua University in Beijing. And uh, in the course of that work, uh, we developed a joint research project on clean vehicles with Tongji University in Shanghai. The head of the Transportation Institute then and our partner was a Chinese uh, gentleman, Professor Wan Gong, who became the Minister of Science and Technology of China at about the same time that I became Obama's science advisor. And the fact that Wan Gong and I had been working together on uh, clean energy issues uh, with particular reference to their impact on climate change. We'd been working together for, for seven years at that point. Uh, we're good friends, had developed a lot of mutual respect and trust. And that was actually very important in uh, the subsequent official U.S.-China uh, interactions on energy and on climate change. Uh, the other thing that proved to be relevant was at the, uh, at the end of the 90s, I served as an emissary of the National Academies of Science and Engineering to the Chinese Academies of Science and Engineering to launch a four academy study, the first that had ever been undertaken, on uh, an agenda for cooperative research on energy technology with a particular eye toward developing and deploying energy technologies which would reduce uh, both countries' impacts on global climate. Uh, that report uh, produced by that four academy study was briefed by me to the joint U.S.-China Commission on Science and Technology, which is the oversight body of the two governments that supervises U.S.-China science and technology cooperation under what was the first agreement reached between the United States and China after the normalization of relations. The Science and Technology Cooperation Agreement was reached in January of 1979. It was signed by Deng and Carter. And uh, the fact that that commission embraced the findings of the Four Academy study on what the United States and China should be cooperating on was uh, ultimately the basis for the agenda of the U.S.-China uh, Clean Energy Research Center which was established by the two governments in 2009, early in the Obama administration, uh, <coughs> advanced uh, in the White House by me and in the Department of Energy by Secretary Chu. Uh, and that had uh, essentially the research agenda, clean coal technologies, efficient building technologies, uh, clean vehicles, uh, research on trucks, and uh, energy water interactions that the four academy study had recommended uh, in the year 2000. The um, other, some other issues just worth mentioning about the U.S.-China interaction. Uh, I started having meetings uh, with Chinese leadership at the level of uh, the uh, deputy heads of the National Development and Reform Commission uh, and the leaders of the major energy initiatives in China in uh, the mid to late 1990s, in part because they were quite enamored of a report that I had led uh, for President Clinton's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology on energy technology innovation. 
uh, and what the role of governments was in energy technology innovation in partnership with the private sector, how it worked, how it could be made to work better, what the priorities ought to be for increased funding. And that was followed by a report uh, for Clinton by PCAST that I chaired on international, very specifically focused on international collaboration. Uh, I am very sure from my experiences in China that more people in China read those two reports by far than ever read them in the United States. In the United States, I think they sank more or less without a ripple, uh, but they had uh, a, a big audience in the, in the Chinese leadership, and they were very eager to advance the ball on uh, U.S.-China collaboration on energy. Uh, with respect to climate change uh, specifically, uh, what I learned in interactions with Chinese colleagues in the late 1990s was that although the rhetoric in the West was that the Chinese didn't care about climate change, were never going to do anything about climate change, therefore the United States shouldn't bother to do anything about climate change because without China, uh, one could not have uh, the needed impact on global carbon dioxide emissions. The fact was that the Chinese climate science community had very much the same understanding of the nature of the climate change challenge as our climate science community. They had run their own models and found, among other things, that the East Asia monsoon had been weakening for 30 years in a pattern that their own models linked to global climate change. The weakening of the East Asia monsoon was inhibiting the transport of water in the atmosphere from the south of China to the north, uh, leading to more flooding in the south and more drought in the north, which has been uh, a long-standing problem. Uh, for China. Of course, as we all know, they were even more interested in air pollution and its effects on human health, but they also understood that many of the measures they needed to take in order to reduce air pollution and its health impacts were also measures that would bring benefits uh, in reducing climate change. Uh, another very uh, interesting sort of side story is the evolution of Chinese views on when their emissions of carbon dioxide might peak. Uh, when I started talking with the Chinese about this in 1995, they said, maybe we could peak by 2045. By uh, 2005, they were saying, maybe we could peak by 2040. By 2009, it was 2035. And at the time of the a joint announcement by President Obama and President Xi in Beijing in November of 2014, that's when they had arrived at the point of around 2030, which is what was embraced in that joint announcement as China's target. The other interesting thing is that Xie Jianhua, who uh, was, has been, and remains the chief Chinese negotiator on climate change, was saying to me privately, and I assume to others as well, <clears throat> that he thought China would handily beat the around 2030 target. That is, that they would be able to uh, peak in their emissions uh, at least by 2025 and maybe even by 2020. Uh, again, this was quite different from what they were saying publicly. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the other thing I will mention, I don't want to take too much time because we have a lot of talent lined up here to my right, um, was that the climate change issue and, and the question of reconciling U.S. and Chinese uh, stances on climate change, uh, again, what happened in the Obama administration was preceded by important antecedents prior to that, there was a back-channel group during the George W. Bush administration headed by Secretary of Treasury Hank Paulson, uh, of which I was a member, that was meeting uh, secretly with, uh, with Xie Jianhua and his team uh, uh, through uh, a, a fairly substantial part of the Bush administration with the explicit aim of trying to get the United States and China on the same page. And those conversations, uh, which all took place in Beijing, and in which during coffee breaks, Xie Jianhua would go off and consult with the president of China on the phone uh, on where the discussions were going uh, and what flexibility he had to, <clears throat> um, to make firmer commitments on the part of China. That was very important. Uh, and 
when Obama came into power and we launched the strategic and economic dialogues with the Chinese, which were yearly meetings alternating between Beijing and Washington, D.C., chaired by the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of China and the Secretary of the Treasury and the, and the uh, Finance Minister of China, uh, we were able to make cooperation on climate change a focus in every one of those strategic and economic dialogues that started in 2009, as I said, were held every year thereafter. And the theme uh, of those discussions at the strategic and economic dialogue with the key uh, cabinet secretaries on the U.S. side, the head of the EPA, the energy secretary, and the key folks on the Chinese side was uh, basically accepting the proposition that unless and until China and the United States stood up together and said, we are the biggest emitters, we're the biggest economies, and we are prepared to lead on this question. Until that happens, we cannot expect the rest of the world to follow. It happened in November 2014 in Beijing. That really made the success in Paris possible, where 195 countries made individual commitments uh, with respect to their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in my judgment, that would not have happened uh, without uh, Xi and Obama uh, coming uh, coming to agreement. Uh, I'm uh, out of time. Mike is fidgeting. So thank you very much, and we'll move on. Thank you, John. <coughs> so um, we we do have a pretty tight schedule, and I'm, I, I'm aware that uh, John is going to leave us uh, around 1 o'clock. So let me suggest that we, we if there are urgent uh, comments or questions for John, let's do it now, and we'll try to keep this to five minutes, and then we'll resume on, uh, with the other members of the panel. So if somebody has an urgent uh, comment or a, or a question for John, please raise your hand. I sometimes yes. say questions, comments, or cries of outrage. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything happening now in the Trump administration? Yes. The, for example, the Clean Energy Research Center uh, continues under the Trump administration. The United States and China continue to cooperate uh, in those domains that I mentioned, although, as we all know, President Trump himself has very little interest in, uh, in most of the focuses. So, uh, but that is continuing. Uh, <clears throat> the, I would say the state of, of, of discussions on an official level, however, as opposed to collaboration on clean energy or collaboration on climate science, uh, has been drastically reduced under Trump. Yes. Was it true uh, that Al Gore assists the uh, terrorist accord by making it Modi? I, I missed the last part. Gore and Modi? There were uh, a lot of efforts, including Vice President Gore's and President uh, Obama's, to keep uh, Modi uh, on the train. And in fact, after Obama returned from the first few days of the, of the Paris meeting to Washington, D.C., he was on the phone to Modi every single day. Obama was on the phone to Modi. Uh, I don't doubt that Al Gore's intervention uh, was very useful. I'm sure it was. Uh, but I'm also sure that if Obama had not been on the phone to Modi every single day, Modi was again threatening to fall off the train uh, and not uh, have India among the uh, 190 some nations that uh, that reached agreement in Paris. Uh, he stayed on the train, uh, and um, we can be grateful for everybody who pushed him in that direction. Thanks, John. Perhaps one more if it's uh, urgent, otherwise we we'll... Yes, Ezra. Ezra. Well, well, first of all, uh, uh, I have to say, although we're supposed to be non-political here, that it's very important that the Trump administration end sooner rather than later, because we really can't afford to lose any more time. Uh, there is a lot still going on in spite of Trump's stance. In the United States, there is the America's Pledge Movement, the motto of which is, we're still in. Trump may be out, but uh, something like 600 corporations, more than 500 universities, uh, scores and scores of cities have all committed to continue doing what they would have done to meet our Paris commitments and indeed to ramping it up to try to compensate for the federal government's 
uh, withdrawal, we are nonetheless uh, losing uh, momentum in a number of important respects because of Trump's stance. Uh, we need to get that momentum back as quickly as possible because, as the IPCC report that Mike McElroy mentioned pointed out, uh, we really don't have any time left to waste. If we want to stop even at three degrees, never mind two, uh, we need to get going. And, and if one looks at the consequences, and some of my colleagues will talk about some of those, if one looks at the consequences that are projected for three degrees and more, uh, we really want to avoid that world. Thanks, John. So let's move on uh, with uh, Peter, Peter Harpers. Maybe I could take a minute myself to ask John if I could ask you a question. You, you suggest that um, maybe there was a kind of internal impetus to peak in terms of emissions before 2030 within China. Uh, does the U.S.'s um, uh, lack of uh, aggressive action at this point uh, make that somewhat less likely in your view, or is that an I internal think dynamic? Uh, I think China uh, is in this to start with, not because we asked them uh, to take an aggressive stance on climate change. They're in it because it's in their own interest. Uh, I don't see any sign that China is uh, becoming less interested in, in meeting those goals because of the United States uh, slippage. And uh, everybody I talk to in China, and I continue to talk to Xi, I talk to the, uh, I'm talking to the environment minister, I talk to the committees in the academies of science and engineering and the folks at Tsinghua and so on, I see no sign that China is uh, going to uh, relent in any way in its determination to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Interesting. Thank you. Um, the, the topic of, of climate change has many facets associated with it. I, I would like to take one particular angle in, in a few minutes here, uh, where I'd like to talk about temperature, water, and food uh, in, in two particular contexts. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the U.S. Midwest and a little bit about eastern China. Um, and what I want to do is uh, talk about some broad numbers and then talk about some very specific numbers. Uh, what I will present uh, is um, quantitative, and it is uh, potentially rather specific. Uh, I hope uh, it is nonetheless uh, of some interest. What it's showing here is peak photosynthesis in terms of that month in the year when photosynthesis is greatest. You can actually observe photosynthesis from space because when you have photosynthesis occurring, leaves fluoresce, that sends an excess amount of energy at a particular wavelength into space that can be seen from satellites. And so we're able to see where photosynthesis is taking place and when across the globe. And I find it interesting that the peak photosynthesis is not in the tropical rainforests or other places. It is in the US Midwest during the growing season when corn is growing vigorously. We give <coughs> corn all the food it wants. Uh, it's not limited by temperature. It's rarely limited by moisture, and it grows extremely quickly. The other place across the face of the earth where you see incredible photosynthesis taking place is the agricultural zones in eastern China. Okay. What happens in those regions will have great consequence for ability to feed uh, populations in the US and China, uh, as well as the rest of the world. Um, let me put some numbers to that. This is the yield in tons per hectare that we've seen broken down as a function of continent by the Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, and what we're observing here is uh, near linear trends across every continent, uh, whereby there has been a doubling in food production. However, you see a different baseline from which uh, these different continents have started from, and that uh, discrepancy amongst continents has continued to grow through time. There are major questions with regard to Africa in terms of how much can yield be increased. Uh, through mechanization, fertilization, and uh, better infrastructure. There are major questions with regard to North America, whether or not a trend like this can be sustained. Maybe there are some you know, kind of thresholds uh, beyond which we'll not be able to get to, and you'll see a departure from this trend. Maintaining this trend, however, is important. Uh, by the FAO's estimates, we need to increase food production by 54% relative to 2005 levels in order to account for a growing population and a population that on the whole globally will be eating higher on the food chain. Okay. So in order to stay still with regard to food security, we need to continue to increase yield. Okay. Or we need to increase the amount of land uh, which is cultivated. Okay. Both of those things can clearly be done in Africa. The degree to which they can be done elsewhere is less clear. Uh, but one way of thinking about this is the need to continue to continue those trends which have historically taken place all the way through 2050. Now, one major <clears throat> question that arises in terms of our ability to sustain 
this green revolution uh, is climate change. So the climate which this cropland will be experiencing uh, is changing and will continue to change. And the degree to which it changes really has two major factors associated with it. There are many regional variations, and I'll go into some of those, but talking at a global scale, uh, how much warming will we realize? Uh, one, as uh, John gave us some perspective upon, has to do with what we decide to do as a world with regard to emissions. And there are two different emission strategies which are outlined here. One is the so-called RCP 4.5, regional concentration pathway, such that we get to 4.5 watts per meter squared excess radiative forcing by 2100. This is a so-called low emission scenario, perhaps not low enough, uh, but certainly lower than the business as usual scenario here with 8.5 watts per meter squared radiative forcing by 2100. That gives us the difference between the dashed lines and the solid lines. The other major distinction is just how sensitive is our climate to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, and that is also quite uncertain. IPCC likely range is between 1.5 degrees Celsius. I think that's too low. I've taken a range here of 2 degrees Celsius up to as much as 6 <coughs> degrees Celsius. These are vastly different outcomes, and we could say a best estimate is somewhere around 3 or 3.5 degrees Celsius. If we trace these scenarios out into the future, having fit them over the historical interval, you see this really qu quite broad spread. All right? 2050, anywhere between 1 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. 2100, anywhere between 1.5 to 5.5 degrees Celsius. These are extremely different climates. What they mean for agriculture production um, is difficult to foresee. It requires understanding what sorts of adaptations uh, would take place, how we, uh, what we cultivate, uh, and desire to have as food uh, perhaps changing as well. Um, I'm only going to go into one little aspect of this. Okay, and so let, let, in, in an attempt to put some numbers to this, let, let me show you just one more figure here. Um, this one is of U.S. maize production since 1960. Uh, it's the average production, and what I've done is I've detrended it. There is a trend that most of the time is understood uh, to result from technological improvement better cultivars, better tractors, smarter farming practices. Okay. What is also shown is the exposure of this U.S. maize to high temperatures. It's accumulated temperature above 30 degrees Celsius. There's an excellent correlation. If you know what the weather that the maize has been exposed to, even just the temperature, not, not the precipitation, you can get a pretty good estimate of how much crop yield you're going to get at the end of the season. Okay. And in part, that's because temperature and precipitation are very tightly linked. If it's dry, it can get hot. Now, a naive thing to do would be to say, as we go into a warmer climate, the exposure to these high temperatures will increase, and we could just take the sensitivity that is observed here to high temperatures and yield and extrapolate that into the future. That is probably too simplistic. In fact, that's almost certainly too simplistic. Okay, what we need to do is think about regional variations, and we need to think about adaptations, and we need to think about the ability to sustain the green revolution going forward. And so let me show you one other way of thinking about this, okay, now this is a lot more detailed. Okay, so here is a map of the trends in high summer temperatures over the last century. It's not at all what I expected to see. Uh, when we made this plot, I thought we had made a mistake first. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, it shows cooling, okay? And the highest temperatures that the U.S. maize is exposed to over the last century has decreased by as much as 2 degrees Celsius uh, in certain places. Okay, more we have a range. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's less than that, but in some of the greatest cooling, it's as much as 2 degrees Celsius cooling. Now, that's surprising because we know the climate is warming as a whole over the century, but why would the hottest temperatures in the summer be cooling? Okay, in part, it's irrigation, but only about 5% of crops are irrigated in the U.S. Midwest. Corn is not an irrigated crop on, on the whole, and so that is not a general explanation. Okay? Rather, what is, uh, I think, an interesting phenomena is if you look where production of corn has increased the most, that's also where you see the greatest cooling. And there's a way to understand that. Uh, a simplistic analogy is to say that a corn stalk is like a straw that is poked in the ground, and it allows for the evaporation and transpiration of water into the air, which is the same way we cool, through uh, evaporation of moisture. When you have a hotter day, the capacity to evaporate determines just how much cooling can take place. And so what we're seeing is on the hottest days, we're seeing greater evapotranspiration which is leading to greater cooling. And you can see that these correspondence between where you get the greatest cooling and where you have this increase in production overlie one another. Okay? And so this adds an interesting wrinkle. Okay? Global warming is causing a longer growing season, but we're also, through a fortuitous situation, actually cooling the hottest temperatures, which would typically 
lead to some damage in terms of yield production. Okay, now this is a two-edged sword. We think about historically U.S. yield in maize now. What we have is a situation where there's almost been a doubling now since 1980. And we thought of this as technological progress, uh, independent of the climate system. But when we develop a statistical ecological maize model, what we're able to do is parse out the different aspects of this trend. And we have a baseline trend, which is primarily improvements in technology. But about 28% of this, we would actually relate to an improvement in the weather that US maize has been exposed to. So lengthening of the growing season and a reduction in exposure to high temperatures have combined to increase this growth in yield uh, above what we would have seen if it had been simply technological improvements alone. And so the weather has been getting better historically, but we've kind of built that into our yield trends. Can we count on this going forward? It's not at all clear. Now let me show you a little bit what's going on elsewhere in the world as well. The U.S. is a great place where we have a lot of data. It's a good place to recognize some of these uh, processes <coughs> unfolding. But when we go into South America, parts of Australia, Canada, as well as eastern China, we see the exact same phenomena as having occurred. That is, the hottest temperatures have been cooling in just the places where we see that the agricultural production has been increasing the most. Okay. Now let me give you a little bit more detail about that. If we look at China in uh, agricultural regions, what we see is that there's been two phenomena. Uh, one is that the harvested area has been increasing over time. So since 2000, we're looking at about almost a 15% increase. Uh, the other thing is that those regions have become more productive. Uh, they have also uh, become overall cooler in terms of exposure to high temperatures, in part because of irrigation and in part because of evapotranspiration increases. Make a point of that. If we go to north, the North China Plain and we look at that season when you have the most crop production, uh, this has, relates to maize, maize, rice, and soybeans, what we see is those regions that have the greatest increase in primary production are also the ones that have the least warming trend. If we go to uh, the eastern China region, you see a very similar phenomenon. They actually have cooling in the regions where you have the greatest increase in primary production. Okay. Um, so what does this mean? Okay. Let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me make two points. One is we need to continue to increase yields. We have been benefiting from improved climate conditions in many of our major agricultural zones. Whether or not that improvement will continue is entirely unclear. What that improvement depends upon is access to water. Okay, you need to be able to evaporate or transpire in order to cool to avert high temperatures and damage to plants. Um, so what we need to understand is the balance of precipitation and evaporation as it will play out in a warming climate. Now this is the last figure I'll show you. It is dense, uh, but it has some very important information on it. Okay, what this is, is a map of the difference between precipitation and evaporation and this is the trend in that quantity as a function of global average temperature. Okay. So to pick one place, if we go to uh, the U.S. Midwest, we have this graph here. Now there are 28 different model simulations that the IPCC collects together to make predictions. And what we see is that there are a range here of a 40% increase in terms of water availability or 40% decrease in water availability. The 50% region is in gray. The 75% region in terms of coverage of the different model simulations is in the lighter gray. And we have no idea what's going to happen. Right? There is more than a plus or minus 70% range in terms of the difference between evaporation and precipitation as predicted by these climate models as we go into these extreme sort of climate changes as much as 5 degrees Celsius, which might happen by 2100 if we were foolish and unlucky. Okay. Similarly, if we go to eastern China, we again see this really large range. If you go into places in sub-Saharan Africa, it is also vastly uncertain. And so here is the issue. If we start to dry out some of these regions, and some of them probably will dry out, our ability to sustain cooler temperatures during the summer, our ability to sustain growth during the summer will be vastly altered. And we don't know where and when that's going to happen because of the great deal of uncertainty associated with our ability to predict precipitation and evaporation. So that leaves us in an awkward and risky position that it would be best to avert. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me suggest that we, uh, we have sort of brief uh, questions after each uh, talk, and then we'll have time at the end for a more general discussion. So 
Let, let's see, uh, raise your hand if you have a point that you'd like to make. Suzanne? Thank you. In terms of uh, the increase in crops and because of um, uh, application of fertilizers and pesticides and in some cases uh, irrigation, uh, you're talking about the air uh, temperature, but there's tremendous damage to water from all of this uh, intensity um, of agricultural production. Uh, you don't cover that. No, uh, like I, this is just one cut through the issue, but you're right. So the access to clean, fresh water and water availability for a variety of other ecosystem services is also incredibly important. Um, and so we have a complex trade-off space in terms of what we would like to optimize um, given uncertain changing boundary conditions. It's, it's quite complex. It's a good point. Thank you for making that. Question over here. Uh, so in, increase in arable land also means destruction of more environmental space. Um, but the scientific question is, you hear a lot about increases in CO2 in the atmosphere changing agricultural production. So what is the <coughs> effect of increased CO2 in the atmosphere, and are you able to evaluate that? Uh, the, the total response associated with increasing atmospheric CO2 will tend to make plants more efficient. Uh, so they'll ne need less water in order to be able to grow. Uh, what we see is in those plants that are optimized for drought regions tend to have the greatest uh, benefit from rising atmospheric CO2. Those don't tend to be our agricultural zones. If, it, if you're looking in a, in a semi-arid environment, maybe you can graze cattle or such, uh, but in terms of growing major food pr products, uh, that, that's uh, typically not possible. Um, but it's an open question. It's not clear. Uh, one other result that bears uh, mentioning is that food growing under higher CO2 tends to have lower zinc concentration. Uh, and so there is a question about how nutritious food will be as well when you change atmospheric CO2. Thank you. So uh, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the next uh, talk, which is Elsie Sunderland. So Elsie, you're up. Thank you all for coming to this interesting discussion, and I want to continue along the, the theme of Peter's discussion, but now move into the marine environment and think a little bit about the role of the ocean um, and how it's affected and how marine productivity is affected by global climate change. I put this, this picture for you all to look at um, because often when we think about the ocean, particularly the open ocean, we tend to think of this, this vast, expansive, unchanging region. So it covers 70% of the Earth's surface area. It can be up to 10 kilometers deep. And we think of it as this, this fairly static area, which is, in fact, completely incorrect. It's this incredibly dynamic environment from a chemical perspective, from a physical perspective, and from a biological perspective. So, when we think about the future, we have to think about how the ocean is then going to respond um, to this warmer climate, where I think we've heard already that the, the one thing we know with great certainty about the future is that it will be warmer. Um, we have tremendous observational and robust observational evidence at this point that warming is un occurring at an unprecedented rate, not only in the atmosphere, but also in the surface <clears throat> ocean. So the rate of increase in ocean surface temperature has been on the order of uh, 0.1 degrees Celsius per decade over the last 40 years, which is really an unprecedented rate of change. And then the question stemming from that, so if we're certain about that, we want to then ask, uh, wh what does that mean then for our global climate system? So I'm giving you a very technical overview here in the slide, as you can see, on, 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 because I want you to take a step back and think, what does the ocean mean for our global climate system as we, as we begin to think about these issues? So the ocean, it's, it, its function in our global climate system right now is really acting as a tremendous buffer, both for heat and for CO2. So a huge amount of the heat that we're seeing at the Earth's surface or excess heat due to the presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, is being absorbed by the ocean uh, and particularly the ocean surface. Um, we can see more than 90% of the excess heat has been taken up by the ocean. This is actually very intuitive if you just think about the relative heat capacity of water versus air. So to raise one liter of seawater one degree C 
takes about, you know, on the order of 4,000 times as much energy as an equivalent volume of air. Um, the ocean exchanges uh, trace gases, so it exchanges uh, <clears throat> CO2 with the atmosphere, and the uptake of that CO2 in the ocean is critical for buffering the concentrations of atmospheric CO2 that we're seeing right now. Um, but this is also a dynamic process. So when the ocean takes up carbon dioxide, it rapidly partitions into a number of other chemical species. Many of you will have heard about ocean acidification. So some of these are weakly acidic, and that can have really dramatic impacts on marine organisms. It's a, the, the, the extent of acidification that we're seeing in the ocean right now is on the order of 0.1 pH units, and it's projected to be up to about 0.4 pH units under a high CO2 emission scenario, um, which, which can have really dramatic impacts on not only um, sensitive marine organisms like corals, but also on the ability of the ocean to actually remove CO2 from the surface ocean. So the, the, this we refer to as the ocean uh, biological pump. So there is a feedback in this process. Um, on the whole, we've seen the ocean, there are estimates of people who work in this field that, that the ocean has taken up about 50% of the excess CO2 produced cumulatively since the pre-industrial period <laughs> by human activity, um, but that capacity seems to be declining as we move forward. So again, my technical summary of what's happening in the ocean, we have temperature increasing, um, we have acidity going up, um, oxygen levels in the ocean are also changing. Oxygen is obviously very important for marine life, um, and oxygen solubility is directly proportional to temperature. So if, as the ocean heats, the solubility of oxygen in the surface ocean is decreasing with other implications for marine life. So now let's think about what this means for ocean productivity and food supply. So as I said, the, the energy flows through the ocean are not just through the abiotic environment, they flow into food webs and we have this energy cascade that leads to the food that we like to eat. So it begins with primary producers in the ocean, the phytoplankton, these are the organisms, these and other uh, secondary producers are um, responsible for that ocean biological pump, so creating that disequilibria between atmospheric CO2 levels and surface ocean CO2 levels, allowing the ocean to take up um, and provide that buffer for our climate system. But what we're the, 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 the productivity in the surface ocean and that energy is also um, directly responsible for, so the levels of productivity uh, govern then the production of the organisms that we as humans like to consume. So we typically enjoy consuming um, at the top of these marine food webs, so these predatory organisms, and we use huge quantities of these uh, smaller fish in my diagram for agricultural purposes, so as fish feed for fish farming, um, for inland agriculture and other things. So we have this energy cascade um, that really is supporting these, this, this huge food source that we rely on. This is the, fisheries are really the, one of the last wild foods and the major wild food that we consume as a civilization. So what, what is that gonna look like in a warming climate? Um, well, so the, the, there is fortunately one, one easy, simple answer and then, and then some complexity. So what we do know is that for the majority of the ocean, what we're seeing is, is warming surface waters, um, the, the productivity in the ocean relies on um, nutrients from the subsurface ocean being delivered to the, the surface ocean. Um, so the warming is increasing and changes in the, in the circulation of the ocean are, are increasing on, on a net average, on a global basis basis, the stratification of the ocean, and we see a decline in global productivity, which in turn 
we, effect, we expect will result in less primary production and reduced availability of prey for those predators that we like to consume. Now, this is a nice, simple story. The nuance in this story is that in some of the most productive ocean regions, so these are upwelling regions, those regions, it's really unclear the directionality of the climate influences. So people are actively working on this area to try to understand some of these feedbacks occurring in those upwelling regions, which supply a huge amount of the fisheries that we consume. Um, the, the, other, the other aspect I want to get you all thinking about when we start to think about en energy, oceans, and food and our health is that the same CO2 intensive emission sources, so these, these uh, coal-fired power plants and other fossil fuel sources, they release large quantities of other pollutants. So the same culprit for climate warming is releasing pollutants like mercury in large quantities to the atmosphere. So on the left, or on your right, um, I'm showing you the CO2 production. You can see the intensity of CO2 emissions from the rapid expansion of coal-fired power in areas like India. There's existing, um, much existing uh, coal production in Asia, although there's been a large effort to control those releases. And that can result um, that in combination with other industrial sources, I apologize for the resolution of this, this figure, but it can result in very high concentrations of contaminants like mercury in the nearshore environment. There are many subsistence uh, fishing communities in this region of Asia that rely on those fisheries for food and for health. Um, and what we're seeing is in some of these highly affected areas, the concentrations of different contaminants can reach levels that are actually harmful to the health of the fisheries themselves. So they, there, there can be a feedback. Um, I like to bring up this example because the solution to both climate and the pollutant problem is the same. You control the sources. Oops. Um, the, the, then there's other nuances to these relationships. So we were talking about the energy cascade through food webs, and I want you to picture that diagram again. Um, but there's a feedback when you think about the bioenergetics of these fish themselves. So when, when seawater warms, it actually affects uh, the, the metabolism of these large predators that we like to consume. So this is on the bottom work by my colleague, William Chung at UBC, looking at um, that because of this increased demand for uh, food and, and increase in metabolism, in some cases, the fish themselves become stressed and become smaller, which can have an economic impact. Some of our own work is looking at using the temperature anomaly in different ecosystems, which I'm showing you on the right, um, and then using that in combination with bioenergetics models to look at how that impacts the contaminant burden <clears throat> in commercially important species like bluefin tuna, which are consumed in large quantities in these different Asian countries. And you can see, and in many ecosystems, what we're seeing is that the dominant future trajectory is actually driven in those large predatory fish is driven by temperature rather than the signal of pollutant releases itself. And so this is quite uh, alarming, but also interesting. Um, so I want to summarize by just, uh, or, or wrap up by just thinking about, so, so then how should we think about the oceans and fisheries in the future? And I want you all just to realize how important the ocean, perhaps I should have started with this, but how important the oceans and fisheries are for, for humans, um, not only just in Asia, but globally. So 10 to 12% of the world's population, um, their livelihood depends either directly or through a dependent on fishing act activities. So this is a huge number of people depend on marine resources uh, for their livelihood. Um, wild fish provide, or, or fishery seafood provides at least 20% of the daily protein intake for more than 3 billion people globally. So it's a huge fraction of our protein supply also uh, provides essential micronutrients. Um, Asia's fish, so when we look to Asia and what's happening in this area, it's a little different from North America and Western Europe where people predominantly 
uh, consume wild fish. So Asia, the Asian fish market has doubled between 1993 and 2013, um, in large part supplied by the growth of farmed fisheries. So the impacts of those that fish farming and how much can be obtained from capture fisheries versus farming is something of great interest. And that th those countries in this region are not only incredibly important for our own wild fish supply, but the populations living in those countries um, consume 70% of the seafood in the global seafood market. Um, and so when we're thinking about the future ocean and sustainability and climate-driven impacts on marine productivity, it's inextricably linked to our food supply and through our food supply, human health. Um, it's pretty clear, and many of you may have seen diagrams like this, but uh, production through, of, of fisheries through capture fisheries has basically plateaued and is now declining. So this, this increased capacity and this increase in uh, demand for seafood really has to come from farm fisheries. Um, in Asia, there's been a, a tremendous innovation in that area and uh, growth in that sector. There are a lot of concerns about the, the sustainability of marine fish farming, though, so mariculture. So that can be an additional stressor, um, which interacts with all these, these other stressors around uh, harvesting fisheries from uh, the changing oceans. And so I just want to conclude by as getting you thinking. So here's my takeaway. Um, you know, when we're thinking about climate and we're thinking about impacts on marine ecosystems, it's inextricably linked to our health and many and the, the well-being of many human populations, both directly through consumption or through their their livelihood. That was my cue to end. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. <laughs> So th thank you again for a f fascinating uh, uh, discussion. So let, let's again have uh, five minutes of uh, urgent questions, and we'll, we'll try to make sure we have a general conversation at the end. So hand up. The, the increase in the, the farmed fish industry and how that, that might or might not feed into the, to the feedback loops <coughs> that the ocean is experiencing. Yeah, well, so I think if, if you see a decline in marine productivity and people are relying on fish, then the only place that that can be uh, compensated for is through additional farmed fisheries. Um, so I think, you know, as clim if climate reduces capture fisheries further, then there is a, even additional pressure to develop those farmed fisheries. And then I think in marine areas where you developed uh, where the where aquaculture is being developed, there are still you know the the, pr the sustainability practices really aren't up to up to par yet. So I think there's a lot of thought that has to go into that because then you have the interactions of multiple stressors in in those ecosystems. Question back. if you can elaborate on this one of the plots that you had to actually show the rise in the mercury I think thousand nineteen nineties but then there were significant dips as well with little peaks so what was the trend that yeah so in in many regions of the ocean we don't just see a, a linear again I think Peter alluded to that with some of his model simulations. You see oscillations, so decadal oscillations in temperature and things like that. So temperature will go up and down in specific ecosystems depending on uh, different currents and things like this. Um, so it's not uncommon. So you, if you look at the, the plot that I showed you, there's an overall large increase since 1970, but you do see um, the uh, sort of decadal scale oscillation and temperature. Thank you, Elsie, and thank you for the questions. Um, okay, one last one over here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, also, I um, want to come back to the um, fish farms or um, mariculture, um, and I wonder um, how you think about um, suggestions to actually um, drastically increase the um, amount of um, seaweed as a means to locally decrease um, ocean acidification to actually help uh, shellfish and so on um, to further exist and in this way to increase um, productivity. And um, also, um, 
the, the other question is um, related to the um, food chain um, that you mentioned. Um, there are also um, proposals to actually um, take out some um, trophic um, levels uh, and to start feeding some apex um, predators and so on with um, plankton. Um, do, do you have an idea if, if this is feasible? I mean, it would solve to a certain degree the uh, mercury um, problem, I think. So you Your first question, I'll go question by question. You can remind me <laughs> if I've forgotten them. So the first question I think was about seaweed as a, a mitigation method. And I know that there's paired aquaculture seaweed growth. Um, in many regions, this can be a really actually economically sustainable thing to do. I've heard more in the context of, uh, of organic enrichment and other impacts in, in the ecosystem more so than ocean acidification. Um, so, so pair, you know, that's what I mean by, you know, the, the sustainability of marine aquaculture is possible, certainly, and, and innovative solutions like that need to be developed. Um, the last part was something about mercury. Remind me of the middle part. Oh, simplify vegetarian fish. Yeah, this has been in the news. I don't know how many of you have seen this. One of my postdocs and I were joking about turning all pelagic predators to be vegetarian, and then an article came out on it the next day. So, so this is a thing. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, it, it's experimental at this stage. It's like you know, you think about the diagram I showed you, and and actually, I, I was talking to one of our faculty candidates the other day, and she was telling me about. Uh, they found uh, small mice in the stomachs of deer in many North American populations. And I think that's relevant in that many wild animals simply consume whatever falls within the size range that they're able to consume, and that's certainly true of fish in the ocean. So in farming, perhaps that can be manipulated a bit more based on the food supply, but those wild fish are consuming basically what they run into in the ocean. Um, and then the implications for mercury of being a vegetarian fish would obviously be good, just as for you, <laughs> if you ate all algal supplements to get your omega-3 fatty acids, you would likely get lower uh, methylmercury exposure. But I don't think that's the, I, th I think you go back to the questions more that Peter was talking about, which is the, the, the first question is, how do we produce the food that people need of high quality? And then how do you minimize those contaminants in that food supply? So thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Steve Wafsi, who's going to uh, uh, talk to us about uh, how we can measure uh, or infer the sources of key gases. <coughs> so in some, in some respects, this uh, talk comes full circle to John Holdren's talk. So he, he discussed various efforts to um, reach agreements internationally that would uh, limit the emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And I pulled up this uh, quite famous quote. I, it's attributed to Peter Drucker, a famous uh, management consultant, um, <laughs> that you can't manage what you can't measure. So uh, what, what most of the uh, agreements that people have reached uh, really focus on accounting type methods. So people with green eye shades and spreadsheets to figure out what the emissions are. And of course, those are um, uh, spreadsheets. And what's actually going into the atmosphere may be something quite different. And there are many examples of major inaccuracies in these spreadsheets. So before talking about the, um, the measurement question, I thought I would remind uh, the audience about what we're actually dealing with here. So this uh, graph shows the, uh, the growth of CO2 since the um, uh, 18th century. And uh, it shows that the concentration of CO2 is now about 47% higher than it was in the 18th century. This is due to human um, impacts. It also shows another key date there, which is June of 1946, which is my birthday, when it was 17%. So just in my lifetime, and I'm not that old, thank you, um, <laughs> that, that excess has quadrupled. And this is clearly not sustainable. Um, I would also add that if all countries of the world immediately froze their emissions so that they didn't increase, that would still go ahead and double. We're not in any kind of steady state, and we'd have at least uh, 100% increase. So it's a very big deal. In the case of methane, the other major greenhouse gas, the concentration has uh, tripled since um, the beginning of the um, uh, major expansion of human activities in the 18th century. So it's a very, very big change. Methane is not just in a greenhouse gas. It's also a very important chemical in the atmosphere. 
just a little bit of perspective on those increases. This is a graph showing the, uh, the total emissions in black over time since 1960. And it shows that the four, the top four um, major um, emitters, or top three anyway, the EU, the United States, and China, have actually leveled off or declining in terms of their CO2 emissions, at least during the last uh, five or six years or so. Meanwhile, the global emissions are continuing to rise. So the challenge is, uh, is really a great one and uh, will affect all nations of the world. Um, let me now talk a little bit about uh, different ways that people have gone about trying to estimate um, what the emissions are and to track them through time. Basically, you need to measure the concentrations of the relevant gases in the atmosphere. You need to uh, be able to contrast the measurements that you make in a source or downwind of a source region with the concentrations of, of uh, the same gas in the inflowing air, uh, then find what we would call an excess uh, due to the emissions, and then use um, sophisticated meteorological simulations to uh, interpret that excess that you observe as an emission rate. And we've actually done quite a lot of this type of stuff, and I'm going to show you a few examples here. So the first one is uh, showing um, uh, a study that was done based on measurements that were made in Miyun in China, which is about 70 kilometers northeast of Beijing. And these emissions, um, th these uh, concentration measurements were begun as it happens in 2003. And so, uh, and they ran continuously and are still running continuously today. And just from this one station, you can actually sample um, a, a significant area of, um, of interest. Let's see, does it show up there? How about laser? Laser is this one. You can, you can see that um, th within this red box is basically the area that you sample. It's actually quite large, covers a reasonable segment of northern China, and um, you can actually use the, me the measurements to track emissions and to quantify them. Uh, this, this graph shows um, a, a simulation and observation of these measurements. The, the time axis here is showing this kind of key period, 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 9, period of very rapid growth of emissions in China, and you can see the observations of the excess CO2 observed at Miyun compared to the model, which is based on uh, the meteorological data and on a beautiful inventory done by Zhao. I believe it was done here at Harvard, or at least part of it was, in which he used the um, uh, 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 data from the provinces rather than national data to make um, a distributed map of emissions in China. And what, what you can see is that there's no need to do anything else other than to use Zhao. It turned out to be right accurate on the money. When we use other inventories, it was not accurate. And then you can actually go ahead and trace what the total changes were over time. And you can see that yeah, during the Olympics year, there was a little bit of a decrease in that general area. Pretty modest, however. Uh, and then going on and increasing again uh, as, as we go in, uh, beyond 2009. Um, in addition to making these kind of long-term measurements, uh, you can also do things like fly airplanes around. So uh, this is um, a simulation of a set of measurements that we made around uh, New York City. So here's Manhattan. There's the Chinese um, consulate is right there. Um, SUNY <laughs> is over here. Uh, Manhattan is right here. And these, the, those colors that show the CO2 concentrations observed in a, in a light airplane flying around the city. And the, you can see from the simulations of the, of the emissions from just arbitrary points that we put out just to illustrate where it is, that, the, um, that you, can, you can image the, uh, the heavy traffic area in Manhattan really, really well. So this type of approach, unlike the static approach, which tells you about a region, <laughs> you do it for a very long time, this allows you to actually pinpoint where the emissions are and to quantify them using this same sort of high resolution uh, method. Now we come to the, okay, what do you do about globally, right? If you, if you have uh, um, uh, airplanes, you can't fly them all around the world, so you, you need some kind of satellite. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a satellite program which is actually under development here at Harvard uh, using a, um, um, a, a satellite that we call MethaneSat. And um, this methane sat, this is one of these things that actually owes its existence to the Trump administration. No politics, but 
Um, it's a ph philanthropically funded um, satellite. You say, what? Nobody's ever done that before? That's right. But people who care about these problems decided to pony up some tens of millions of dollars to support this. It's, uh, it's um, originated by the Environmental Defense Fund. And this is a simulation of what it's going to see. In this case, um, <coughs> Dallas-Fort Worth area is here. You can see these plumes, in this case, of methane. Uh, being simulated from the different sources there, the oil and gas industry. The biggest ones are actually landfills. Um, and, and indicating that, yeah, you can really see these things, and uh, it's not a great stretch of the imagination to realize that you can quantify the emissions uh, using this type of approach. If I um, just take a, a step back, so the, the, this is actually a frame that the satellite will, will observe. Here are your oil and gas operations out here. There's your landfills. There's uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. <coughs> um, this is really something. Um, this type of satellite, uh, not just this one, but some others which, uh, are in the works, should be providing data within about a five-year time frame so that uh, we may be able to actually um, understand what the emissions are. I believe um, when Mike was talking about uh, with introducing me, he said something about checking up on what people are doing. It's not actually, we're not trying to be the carbon police here. What we're actually doing is providing information to policymakers about what's actually happening. Almost all the time, the people who are managing these things are very well intentioned, but how do you get the data? How do you actually know? How do you know what's being emitted? What, how you know is to look. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take any questions. This, we, have, we have a network here around Boston that's been running since 2012. Got a few papers out on this, talking about emissions of methane and CO2. And it can be a bit of a challenge to do these measurements. As you can see, there's our inlet on top of a tall building um, near Copley Square that we're not allowed to say what it is, but it looks like it has a hat on. <laughs> which window which window is this? And that's a peregrine falcon, and that's our inlet. And he's guarding it, but also maybe we would prefer he not sit right on top of it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> so, again, um, questions for uh, Steve? Please. Yes. Uh, the, the tundra. Mike. Hmm. The tundra is melting, and it contains vast resources of methane, which can be rapidly released into the atmosphere. You, CO2 is different from methane in, in the sense that methane is a more rapid gr greenhouse gas than CO2. So if there were a, a large abundance of methane release from tundra, <coughs> melting could that increase the global temperature so it could actually be a feedback i can tell you that we we've done these same types of things all over the north slope of alaska since starting in 2012 uh, and also uh, we were able to access um, measurements made at uh, what used to be called point barrow and now has a name that i can't pronounce very well you 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 you, you quiet quick or something like this. But um, uh, there actually is no evidence for methane making it to the atmosphere from the tundra, but there is evidence, uh, due to warming, but there is evidence for CO2. And the reason is that there is a lot of methane that can be released from the soils under the tundra, but dry soil on top is excellent at removing methane. So uh, this has been known for some time. There's been some controversy and back and forth about whether there will be a big release of methane. I would have to say currently, the evidence is that the release is coming out of CO2. Um, I wouldn't want to swear that that will continue forever, but that is what you currently see. You also have big resources of methane and methane hydrates in the shallow waters of the Bering Sea and uh, in the Arctic Ocean, uh, Beaufort Sea. Uh, and those likewise, they come out as bubbles and they get consumed before they make it to the atmosphere. Other questions? Yeah, cows are very important, and the biggest sources that you saw in that picture of Fort Worth were landfills, not oil and gas. So in thinking about trying to restrain methane um, increases in the atmosphere, we need to think about all of them, absolutely. Uh, dairy cows are actually m um, much more significant than you might expect uh, because of the very rich diet that they eat. 
So uh, you can think about that. <laughs> so how, how about rice cultivation? Rice cultivation is also, it can be a big issue as you go to multi-cropping, you need to add more fertilizer. The more fertilizer you add, the more um, methane you get out of a rice field. So uh, they're, they're all important. I, I, I had intended to put a little pie chart there that shows all the, the contributions, and it's a very diverse pie chart. It has wedges about this big, including oil and gas and cows and um, rice health cultivation, et cetera. So let, let me ask uh, one, one other question, Steve. Uh, obviously, uh, China is, 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 is a major, uh, co major cultivation of rice, and uh, the animal uh, population is increasing and so on. Do we really know what the uh, Chinese uh, methane emissions are? I don't know how we would know without having data. So there are measurements made in China. I don't know whether you saw it on there, but there was a little notation I put that the data have to be available. Data generally not available from those measurements. So people make the measurements, but you can't use them. So um, the answer is we don't know, but we could know. Good job. Thank you again. So we, we, we have time for um, so, so general um, discussion. Uh, l let me just um, make a few uh, comments. Um, I, I'm not sure that I, I share uh, John's uh, optimism about uh, China's ability to maximize its emissions in the near term. Uh, if, if you actually look at what's been happening in China, the, the Chinese government made a, an aggressive decision to develop all of the possible energy sources that they possibly could do, nuclear, wind, solar, uh, hydro, and so on. And to do that as quickly as possible in order to uh, cut back on the CO2 emissions. But let's, let's sort of realize what's actually been happening there. Let's take the wind issue. China has invested more resources in wind than any other country in the world. They are number one in investment in wind. We're number two. However, China is number two in production of electricity from wind, despite the fact that they have more wind turbines uh, in uh, northern regions of China. Why is that? Well, the reason, one of the important reasons for it is that in order to heat buildings and houses in winter in northern China when it's cold, the standard way of doing it is to distribute hot water. The hot water is produced from a coal-fired combined heat and power plant. So, in order to provide the hot water, you're also producing electricity. So you're producing more electricity than is needed in northern regions of China, so the wind turbines are turned off. And so uh, this is a, a significant issue in terms of, uh, of the future of uh, wind in, in China. In fact, the Chinese government has introduced regulations to limit investments in wind in northern regions of China where the abatement, where the, the curtailment is more than 20%. And so, in fact, for the last two years, investments in wind went down relative to previous years in China. So that's, a, that's an issue to, to, to keep in mind. Now, there are ways around that, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, worth uh, considering. One other comment I want to make is that uh, the, pri the, the price of alternative energy sources, for example, such as wind and solar, have been going down precipitously over the last uh, uh, period of time, to the point where you know, investments in, in either solar or wind at the moment are in fact competitive with production of, uh, of electricity from fossil fuel sources. And that's true in the United States, and it's also true increasingly in China. There's one other very interesting development that is worth mentioning, which is that um, you might have read that uh, there was a, an auction a few weeks ago for offshore uh, 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 real estate in the uh, south, of, uh, of Nant uh, south of Nantucket in, in uh, international, in U.S. Uh, uh, federal waters to provide opportunities to produce electricity from offshore wind. The big surprise was that the leases that were awarded to three consortia realized for the federal government $450 million. It was astonished and was oversubscribed. So there's clearly a major interest in offshore uh, development of, of electricity in, in, in the United States in particular. And, and why, what's going on here? What's going on is that the price of offshore electricity is now coming down to the point where it's competitive with uh, natural gas in, in, in Massachusetts, for example. So if, if you, in fact, build those offshore wind turbines, the price of electricity in Massachusetts will go down 
and the price of uh, the development, the demand for natural gas will go down. That's why these people are, in fact, investing these significant resources in the opportunity to survey the regions. Okay, the other interesting thing is that who's doing it? The three, the three winners, the three bids, are significantly invested, uh, the investors are significantly European. One of them is, uh, in, in fact, Shell is, is a, a joint partner in one of them. So what's going on there? What's going on is that uh, European offshore development has led the world over the last number of years. It's now peaking, and the opportunity is moving elsewhere. And so there is clearly a significant opportunity to do this in the United States. But in, in our group, for example, we've been looking, and some of my, my colleagues are in the audience here, we've been looking at what is the offshore potential for wind development in China? And the answer is, it is enormous, because China has significant, um, uh, the depth of water up to 200 uh, nautical miles is relatively low. So the opportunity to invest some of these major new turbines in offshore and to bring the power onshore where the demand really is. Part of the problem in China is that the onshore demand, the onshore production is largely in the northern region, but the high demand is in the coastal region. So how do you get the power from there to well, if you're going to do it offshore, then it's a, it's a really a really interesting uh, op opportunity. And uh, I might also say that we did a study a number of years ago on the global potential for wind-generated electricity, and looking at the 10 largest emitting countries, all of them onshore had the potential to, in fact, cut down on their CO2 emissions very significantly, with the exception of Japan, Ezra. But for Japan, the interesting thing was that while the opportunity to, do, to develop electricity from onshore, onshore uh, uh, wind turbines was relatively minimal, we've just decided that the opportunity to do it offshore in Japan is very significant indeed. So this is an interesting new uh, 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 opportunity for development of renewable forms of, uh, of, of energy. I'm not going to keep uh, talking to this, but I want to make one other point, which uh, was alluded to uh, by John, I think, which is that we're watching changing uh, uh, meteorology that is associated with the global uh, warming, if you want to think of that as, as going on. Basically, what you expect and what you observe is that the, the continental areas are warming relative to the ocean. That's entirely to be expected. The consequence of that for Asia is that the East Asian monsoon, uh, particularly in winter, has warmer land uh, relative to the ocean compared to what it was before. And so the East Asian monsoon is slowing down. So the, 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 the winds are decreasing. That actually has implications also for the production of electricity from wind turbines. But more significantly, it has implications for air quality. Because if the, if the air is moving out more slowly, then the danger from air, air pollution is, in fact, increasing. And so that's another issue that we need to be uh, very carefully considering, consider very carefully. The other thing that I don't think we've actually emphasized well enough is that this issue that we've been talking about, uh, you know, the various opportunities to uh, the, the various challenges that we face, they're, they're, they're not in 2100. I mean, they're immediate. They're really right now. And, uh, and if you're going to actually address the issue of cutting down emissions to effectively zero on a 20 year timescale, we're not going there. China's not going there. Japan's not going there. India's not going there. The United States is not going there. CO2 emissions are actually going up globally over the last few years. So it, this is actually an immediate and very serious uh, problem. So let me stop there and, uh, and encourage general conversation from the audience and suggestions for ideas that we might want to discuss. Yes? There was a lot of discussion about the need to, a lot of discussion about the need to increase uh, agricultural production, but how will the melting of the glaciers in the Himalayas impact this possibility? So, so uh, glaciers act as reservoirs seasonally for water, uh, building up in the winter and then discharging additionally in the summer when you need the water. Uh, that's helpful. Snowpack also does that. Uh, the, the question is, uh, how much will this modulation of water resources evening out change uh, as glaciers change? Um, I, I like glaciers. I, I study glaciers. I think they're fascinating. Uh, they do serve important purposes, and for certain uh, uh, societies, uh, especially say in Tibet, uh, there are in some cases a close proximity to glaciers, such that flooding and other issues are um, of immediate concern. Um, overall, though, if you look at say China, uh, the 
vast uncertainty in how precipitation and evaporation will change overwhelms the uncertainty or the, the change in the modulation associated with glacier loss. So it is an additional concern, uh, but I would say it's a second order relative to the other larger issues with regard to overall changes in precipitation. The, the other thing to note, uh, and there are pros and cons with this as well, of course, but building of dams in many ways can supplement or um, at least improve upon uh, the access to water though with denigration of the local environment uh, as, as, a, as a consequence. Thank you. Up to the left. Oh, yes. <coughs> uh, hi, I'm a PhD student in plant biology and also on the board of directors of Botanic Society of America, and I want to mix some comment about the questions about crop production uh, in the changing climate. A quick background of why I want to comment on this is that three weeks ago, I represented my society as well, together with all the other representatives from more than 30 professional societies, as well as scientists from the federal government, and uh, representatives from private sectors. All together, we come together for one goal, is to envision, envision what plant biology will be like in 10 years, what our priorities are and uh, our responsibilities. So of course we just spend most of the time talking about the challenges in crop production in the changing world, but uh, unanimously the biggest challenge we identified is actually the limitation for nitrogen access rather than water because plants, all plants almost, but one group of plants have the ability to really fix nitrogen for themselves. So giving everything ideal, constant, more fertilizer wouldn't really increase crop production that much because the, the plants are in, able to really uptake all the nitrogen that's provided. And all the fertilizers, of course, break the environment that's not sustainable. And for the comment um, question about whether increasing CO2 level should increase crop production. Um, ideally, it's true, and there is a term for it. It's called CO2 fertilization, but that's not really improving crop production for two reasons, is that once plants uptake uh, CO2, it's losing water as well. So in the changing climate that has less water availability, that's not really uh, solving, um, causing a actually more problem than than the solving problem. But also, fixing CO2 needs a lot of nitrogen, and again, go back to the nitrogen inability of fixing nitrogen in plants, that that's why increasing CO2 level in the atmosphere will not really fertilizing um, the plants. Just want to comment on that. Here, you wanna respond? Uh, I mean, I think we're scraping at uh, some much larger and more detailed conversations that we might have. Uh, let, let, me, let me just say a couple things. With regard to access to nitrogen, I mean, how much nitrogen is applied is an important determinant of how much nitrogen will be available to a plant. Uh, sometimes that nitrogen will be washed away, uh, and so understanding changes in precipitation uh, can be an important uh, kind of additional factor to take into account there. Overall access to nitrogen and overall degree of fertilization and overall washing away of nitrogen um, I, I think it's a matter of uh, how much we wish to invest and how much we wish to preserve water quality in, uh, in adjacent areas. Uh, with regard to CO2 fertilization, what, what happens is a plant opens up its stomata and its leaves in order to be able to take in CO2, and when it does so, it loses water at the same time. Higher atmospheric CO2 means you don't have to open up your stomata as much or as long in order to be able to obtain a similar amount of CO2, and it means that you can guard against water loss. There are many different models out there for exactly how this will play out in terms of plant productivity, some of which suggest major uh, improvements, some of which suggest minor improvements. I don't actually trust these models a lot. If you look empirically, though, at free air carbon experiments where people have uh, increased atmospheric CO2 ambiently and observed responses, it's really in semi-arid regions where you see a large response that's well documented. In other places, it's much less apparent. And so I think the jury is still out in terms of what uh, rising atmospheric CO2 will do to crop production in tandem, perhaps, with our ability to breed plants that can take better advantage of higher atmospheric CO2. So, um, yep. 
Charlie. One more comment. Most, many of the issues that were raised are dealt with if people who have more access to food, the food is more affordable. Less methane emissions. China, my understanding is that there's a opposite direction. Talk about the solutions to these problems, but there's a really simple solution. Now encourage vegetarianism. Yeah, so I, I, I interact with a lot of fisheries groups, and they have this, and of course they're biased toward eating fish, but the, there, there's a common theme of the conversation, which is food is much more than food. So food is culture and food is society. And so this idea of you know, being vegetarian is somewhat contrary to the cultural identity, I think, of a lot of Asian populations. What I think can be done sustainably is uh, sustainable farming of, say, fish as food, which is really key to the identity of this population. And then also this idea that came up earlier, maybe not vegetarian people, but lower trophic level species, vegetarian predators. I'm not sure that will work. But but, but being more sustainable in terms of the, the, the way certain foods are consumed. Um, yeah. I am vegetarian, though. So am I. It's so Peter. We also skipped lunch today, which yeah. I, I think helped. <laughs> Thank you. I, I had a question about the um, the effect of agriculture on um, on precipitation and and the evaporation that you were showing. Do you have I any information on if this goes back centuries, if or if there's something different that has been going on recently, whether because of the concentration of, of agriculture in a sim similar place or some kind of adaptation, or is this something that would have happened, say, a thousand years ago when you had um, intense agriculture as well? Um, the intensity of agriculture has continued to increase in terms of the density of planting uh, which occurs and also the rooting depth with, with, in, in terms of access to water. So you used to be able to walk between corn rows. That's not possible anymore. Uh, they're planted more densely. Um, and you do see uh, increased recycling of water in tandem with increased evapotranspiration. And so in places where there is uh, additional evapotranspiration occurring, you can also see increased precipitation. So, so, so uh, w what we have done to the uh, uh, landscape most recently are major changes. And the style of farming, although it takes a similar footprint, uh, has led to a much more rapid um, putting on of carbon uh, mass through the growing season and the ability to interact with the hydrological cycle in a more intense way. Uh, the reason why yield is continuing to increase has a lot to do with the way that uh, we have modified cultivars to be able to more effectively take up water, take up nutrients, and to grow rapidly. Um, so we're, so it's, this is different. This is not the type of agriculture you saw a thousand years ago. It's not the type of agriculture you saw 50 years ago. There are major rapid advances in terms of the types of plants that are out there and how densely they're planted and how rapidly they grow because of fertilization. So, yeah, now r rice paddy is really quite a different thing because there obviously there is unlimited water at the surface uh, for much of the growing season. Yeah. Jen? Uh, recently, sh in the end of January, early February, Chicago experienced uh, extreme weather, uh, minus 30, 40 degrees. Um, and then Trump tweeted, uh, where is global warming? Global warming, please come. And what is the uh, scientific explanation for uh, this extreme weather? Well, so I would just uh, want to point out that they had the warmest year on record in Britain to this year. So it depends on which side of the uh, pond you're on. <clears throat> and these sorts of fluctuations are, are quite normal. Um, 
When I was a student at University of Chicago, we had a month where the temperature never went above minus 20, and you've never seen that since. So there, there, there's a general warming trend, and you'll have fluctuations, and it's not really related to global warming at all. It's a blip, and there'll be more blips, and uh, what climate represents the uh, ensemble average of the whole planet or the whole or, or each zone on the planet. And when you look at those, you could see from that temperature curve that um, I think Elsie showed, the climate's warming really fast right now. It doesn't so, matter whether it's cold in Chicago. <laughs> so there, there, there is a, a view that, uh, well, it, it, it is a fact that uh, what, what really gives us these, these extremes is the, uh, the behavior of the jet stream. And if the jet stream is moving slowly and develops a big meander, you can spend a significant amount of time in polar air, which is basically why we had this very, very cold uh, weather. But the, the, the underlying scientific question is whether that is a natural phenomenon and we're simply having bad luck or whether it is in fact related to what humans are doing. And one of the ideas is that it, in fact it's the warming of the Arctic Ocean that is developing, that is ultimately responsible for the changes in the behavior of the jet stream. But we don't know. It's an ongoing issue. And so, um, but the fact is that despite the fact that we've had very cold uh, conditions uh, over much of the United States and actually currently also cold over, over uh, the British Isles, the, the fact is that we still had the, the three warmest years on record on a global basis over the last three years. Here you are, add to that. Um, maybe just one one note of caution that um, when you see a blip in either direction, one shouldn't attribute it to climate change too quickly. Because on the one hand, it's it's a equally fallacious. If you have an extremely hot summer, uh, if you have an extremely cold winter, at points they they stand out. And we have to be careful just how close of a connection we draw between individual events and the long term changes. And so there's a certain degree of moderation and interpretation and not rushing to conclusions for whatever uh, particular end you're interested in uh, with respect to individual events. So one, one of the earlier uh, uh, talks in this series was about the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And we haven't talked about it uh, today, but um, I think it, it is important to realize that uh, much of the investment that is occurring in the Belt and Road Initiative right now is investment in coal-fired power plants. So in fact, China may be working to cut down on its domestic sources of uh, uh, consumption of coal, but indirectly, it is in fact uh, uh, funding uh, uh, significant amounts of uh, coal-fired uh, power over the Belt and Road Initiative. So what's going to happen in the Belt and Road Initiative is also clearly an issue in terms of uh, climate change. And one of the questions is, what is actually going on here is, is it that China, as China is cutting down on its uh, consumption of coal, there's a large number of people involved in the coal industry that could be out of work. Is this an opportunity to provide them with opportunities for employment in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, even in, uh, in uh, East uh, Africa? So that's another issue that I think is worth uh, having serious conversation about in the future. We have about another, yes. Is climate change changing the uh, the currents, the worldwide currents? In the atmosphere and the ocean, or which one are you more particularly interested in? Okay. Steve, you want to go? No. Not me. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, I, I mean, climate change is, is changing everything, and the question is how much and how detectable is it? Um, the... Uh, with respect to uh, overall atmospheric circulation, we see small changes in the location of the tropical circulation patterns, in particular with something called an intertropical convergence zone. Now that's because the northern hemisphere is heating more than the southern hemisphere, and you get a shift northward. That's what the models predict, and there's some evidence that we can observe it. Uh, with regard to weather patterns that we're seeing here in the mid-latitudes, which are associated with the atmospheric jet, mid-latitude jet, um, they're, that's a really contentious subject, uh, and the scientific community uh, speaks forcefully to both sides. Um, I think it's too early to tell, uh, but there could be changes there, and if it does change, uh, there'll be implications for the variability associated with climate. And so 
in many ways, it's that second order issue. It's not just the change in the mean, but will the variability around that mean in some way change as well? And that's important. It's an open question. I don't have a clear answer for you at this point. With regard to ocean circulation, if the winds change, the ocean circulation changes. If the density of the surface ocean changes, the ocean circulation changes. And both of those things are happening because of changes in, in the winds, as I noted, but also changes in the precipitation and in terms of melting from ice sheets. Um, and the big question is, how important are those changes? Uh, changes in ocean circulation could have implications for uh, overall temperatures, say, in the North Atlantic, as often sp uh, spoken about. And, and there again, uh, I, I would really uh, defer that to a, a subject that is an ongoing debate within the scientific community that we don't really have good, clear, simple answers for uh, at this point. Yes. Back row. Okay, uh, Stefan Hübner, I'm visiting scholar um, at the Asia Center. I think I didn't mention that. Um, I have a question um, regarding the um, last presentation um, by uh, Michael McElroy. Um, you, you talked a lot about um, offshore wind um, energy um, generation. Um, I think in the last uh, five-year plan, um, the tar target was something like um, five gigawatt, which is actually quite low compared um, to onshore wind uh, energy generation, um, solar energy generation, and so on. Um, even though actually um, places like um, waters um, of um, Shanghai or um, Bohai Sea and so on are actually quite close to the um, big uh, urban centers of China compared, for example, to um, China's north. Um, so the distance is uh, yeah, um, not really the um, problem here. Um, so what do you actually identify as the reason why this is compared uh, to other um, forms of energy generation not really taking off as quickly as it um, could if there's so much potential. And the, the second question would be, um, that there's a lot of um, plans um, to cover um, the surfaces of lakes with um, um, solar um, arrays. So um, solar energy um, on lakes is quite an important topic um, by now. Um, do you see any potential to do this uh, on the surface of the ocean in the near future? Is this um, also maybe um, an opportunity for renewable energy generation? Thank you. In, in terms of uh, offshore uh, wind, which I think is, is the most promising uh, opportunity, why is it that the cost of offshore wind has come screaming down over the last number of years? There are several factors that are involved there. One is that uh, we're now building larger turbines that go higher in the atmosphere and capturing more reliable winds. And that is lowering the cost. And then the other uh, issue that's affecting the cost is in fact, that it's become a very competitive industry. The competition to build these large turbines is, you know, is, is global effectively, and that's, uh, that's a major uh, player as well. You know, t t typical onshore wind turbines in China are about uh, 1.5 or 2 megawatts in, in individual size. But General Electric, for example, is working on a prototype uh, 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 offshore turbine that would be as much as 12 and a half megawatts. And the stuff that's going in off Massachusetts is, in fact, 8 megawatts. So that's, uh, that's a major consideration that is going on. And at the same time, what is happening is that, you know, not only is the is the uh, the, the 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 cost of, of wind generated electricity offshore and on onshore going down, but also the cost of solar PV in particular is also going down. So you have an interesting opportunity that that uh, the renewable sources are in fact right now cheaper than coal. If you're going to build a new coal-fired power plant, you, it'd be, you're better to rely on wind and solar. Uh, and, and the challenge is, how do you make the transition from here to there? And one of the challenges we have to face is that the, the variability of the sources is a problem. You know, mating the variability of the uh, wind and the, and the sun uh, solar source with demand for electricity is, is a significant problem. The other issue is that, of course, you, you're not likely to be able to uh, fly your planes uh, uh, using electricity from wind and solar. So the opportunity to try to make the transition from uh, to a more electrically driven uh, economy is, is clearly important. And one of the key issues here, one of the key challenges is to find a way to store electricity. I mean, I, I mentioned the problem of, um, of wind uh, in, in China, where, in fact, 
you're turning off the turbines because you can't actually store the electricity that would be otherwise produced. Okay, you can store electricity with batteries, that's one possibility, and there's some interesting work going on here at Harvard on trying to develop cheaper, more economically effective uh, batteries. But I, I think, and also, also if you have more electrically driven cars with batteries, then the batteries in those cars become a distributed opportunity to store electricity. You can charge the batteries at night when the electricity is cheap, and if you don't want to uh, drive your car on a hot summer day, you can sell electricity back to the, to the grid. So those are opportunities. My, my own view is that we actually need to move to a different uh, uh, view of the future, particularly in the transportation sector. Yes, we're going to have battery-driven cars, but in terms of large trucks and buses and so on and trains, you know, batteries is not the way to go there. We need to have another way to do it. And the other way to do it is to use uh, fuel cells and to uh, charge the fuel cells with hydrogen, which you produce from electrolysis using carbon-free sources of electricity. And I believe uh, that that is going to be economically competitive and that it is potentially the future. And John, uh, when he was here, mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the former uh, minister for science and technology in, uh, in, uh, in China. And he mentioned the fact that uh, that, uh, that individual had been a major proponent of battery-powered cars. And China is producing more battery-powered cars than any other country in the world at the moment. A week ago, this, this individual was, uh, was quoted as saying that the future is fuel cells, and we need to actually get b busy now on the idea of using hydrogen and fuel cells to, 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 to run long distance uh, transportation in the future. So I, I really think that that is happening. And interestingly enough, I think the Japanese are actually ahead of the game here in that they actually have, in fact, uh, thought seriously about the possibility of fuel cell driven uh, vehicles uh, uh, more than we have, more than the uh, Chinese have up to now. We're running out of uh, out of juice and time. Um, just yeah. Briefly, I mean, you, you mentioned batteries, but also in China, our super grids are so low resistance. Yeah, and uh, you know that's that's true. And uh, the uh, high voltage DC connections from the Three Gorges, for example, to the coastal regions are are pretty important. But it, it turns out that, uh, that the high voltage connections uh, don't actually solve the problem of bringing the, the, uh, the, uh, the power from the, the wind-rich uh, northern uh, plain to the coastal areas. However, bringing it onshore from offshore is, is, is pretty straightforward. If you look at the cost of offshore wind, a, a relatively minor part of the cost is the, is, is, is the, uh, the, 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 the transport of the power from the region offshore, even uh, as much as 100 uh, miles away, to, to onshore. So I think that is really an important part of the future. I mean, I've actually, there's one issue that didn't come up here. We, you, the gentleman back here mentioned, uh, li li mentioned uh, the nitrogen story. Maybe I'll sort of kick this to, uh, to Steve. I mean, the fact is that we are forcing the nitrogen cycle uh, on a global basis for agricultural purpose with fertilizer, with uh, soybeans, uh, with nitrogen fixing uh, plants. And uh, one of the consequences of that is that there is a, an increase in production of nitrous oxide. So the third most important greenhouse gas after CO2 and methane is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is going, going up like that also. So Steve, uh, what do you think? Um, I think that nitrous oxide is potentially a significant issue. So uh, when you apply fertilizer to fields, you produce it. You produce it sometimes uh, in um, various wastewater type applications, uh, landfills. So it's certainly um, out of balance in terms of its current rate of increase, it, that its current rate of increase is increasing. It's kind of a slow walker because it has a very long lifetime. Um, and it will continue to increase in the future. So uh, one does need to think about all of those things together. But um, yeah, if we all became vegetarians, as Charles suggested, this would actually um, improve the nitrous oxide situation as well. Well, I'm, I'm actually worried about the nitrous oxide from uh, two points of view. Okay, the climate issue is one. But of course, it also is, uh, is a source of nitrogen oxides in the stratosphere that destroys ozone. And that means that there's going to be more ultraviolet radiation reaching the surface of the Earth, and people with fair skin like me are particularly vulnerable. So I'm, I'm opposed to that. <laughs> um, uh, if there is no um, uh, further question, we've, we're, we've hit the deadline. I, I was asked to uh, advertise a, uh, a talk that's going to be given at the uh, Asia Center by Mr. Matsudani uh, on the 
6th of May. He is a, a fellow, a resident fellow at the Asia Center, and he's going to be speaking about the social cost of automobiles and environment policies in Asia, a comparative study of China and Japan. So thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to all of the members of the panel. <laughs> So let's exchange email and decide when we can do it. It would be nice to chat with you just for just a few minutes.